Welcome back to this next video in which we are studying headaches. Okay, so we want to discuss the pathophysiology of migraine headaches. And in order to do that, we need to discuss some background anatomy. And the background anatomy that we need to go over is the anatomy of the meninges. And the reason we need to go over this is because the pain of a migraine headache is believed to arise because of the activation of nociceptors that innervate the meninges, the so-called meningeal nociceptors. Therefore, we need to first discuss the anatomy of the meninges themselves, and then we need to discuss the anatomy of the innervation of the meninges. And then we can go on to discuss the pathophysiology of migraine headaches. So let's come down here and let's let me put a uh, little title here. So we're now going to study the anatomy of uh, the meninges. So firstly, what actually are the meninges? So the meninges are a set of free membranes free membranes that cover the brain and the spinal cord, so the central nervous system. Now, we are, of course, particularly interested in the meninges that actually cover the brain, uh, but they do also stretch down and cover the spinal cord as well. So they are free membranes that cover the entire central nervous system, and they fill the gap in between the central nervous system and the bone that is around the central nervous system to protect it. Now, in the case of the brain, the bone that is around that is, of course, the skull, and in the case of the spinal cord, the bone around that is the vertebral column. So in the space between the central nervous system and the surrounding bone, that is where you find the meninges, these free membranes. Okay, now I will give you this warning that the anatomy of the meninges is not particularly easy to understand. It is quite difficult to visualise. So I will draw lots of pictures to try and help you to understand this anatomy. Right, uh, so let's start by uh, writing out the names of the three separate uh, meninges. Uh, so we'll start with the outermost one, the one that is closest to the bone uh, and furthest away from the brain and the spinal cord, the central nervous system. Uh, and that is called the dura mater. So the outermost meninge is the dura mater. Inside of that, the middle meninge is called the arachnoid mater. And then inside of the arachnoid mater, the innermost meninge, the one that is closest to the central nervous system, that is actually lining the brain and the spinal cord, that's called the pia mater. Okay, so these are the names of the three separate meninges, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. And we're going to go through their anatomy one by one. Now, where am I going to begin? You might think that it would be a sensible place to begin with the dura mater and then work our way downwards, but that's not how I'm going to do it. I'm going to actually start with the innermost one, the pia mater. And the reason I'm going to start with the pia mater is it's actually, by far, in my opinion, the easiest one to understand. The most difficult one to understand is the dura mater, because the dura mater has two separate layers, as we'll come on to, and because of it having two separate layers, you're able to form things like dural folds and dural venous sinuses, and those are complicated structures that we'll talk about when we come on to the dura mater, whereas the pia mater is incredibly easy to understand. Now, the reason that the pia mater is so easy to understand is that it literally does just line the brain and spinal cord. So provided that you know the anatomy of the central nervous system, provided that you know the shape of the central nervous system, you also know the shape of the pia mater. So let me just draw a little picture here, and this is a picture that we've seen previously. It's just a picture of the brain and the top of the spinal cord viewed from the side. So let's just draw this here. So there's the temporal lobe, there's the occipital lobe, the parietal lobe, and the frontal lobe, like so. And then we'll have the bottom portions of the brainstem peeking out from underneath, so there's the bottom of the pons, and the medulla below it, and then the spinal cord continuing on there, and then here is the cerebellum. So, left cerebral hemisphere, bottom of the pons, the bottom of the medulla, the spinal cord here, and the cerebellum here. And of course, I haven't drawn the whole spinal cord, but it would continue on down here. So, here's our central nervous system. The pia mater, if we're going to build the pia mater, 
It's a very thin little membrane that we're going to put all the way around the central nervous system. So imagine coating the entire thing in this membrane that's the pia mater. And as I say, this is a very thin membrane. And the other important thing about it is that it's going to perfectly lie or line the surface of the central nervous system. It's going to follow all the little fissures, all the little sulci and all the little crevices. It's going to go into all of the little crevices and it's going to be exactly the same shape as the surface of the brain is my key message here. So for instance, let me put on the central sulcus onto this picture. So this is one of the sulci that we have been previously talking about, the central sulcus here. Of course, there are loads of other sulci on the surface of the cerebral hemispheres, but this is the only one we've discussed so far, so it's the only one that I'll put on here. And remember, this is where the cerebral cortex has invaginated inwards. The surface of the cerebral cortex has invaginated inwards. It's folded inwards. So if you were a little man standing here and you went into the central sulcus, on either side of you, as you go down it, would be a surface of cerebral cortex. Okay, it really is an invagination of the cerebral cortex to increase the surface area of the cerebral cortex, and the brain is covered in them. Now, this pia mater that we're going to put over the surface, you might think, well, maybe it'll just go right over the top of the sulci, but no, it doesn't. It goes right down into the sulci. It invaginates too, so that it's coating all of the cerebral cortex surface that is lining those sulci. So it's very, very close to the surface of the brain. It has the exact same shape as the surface of the brain and the surface of the spinal cord. And that's why, in my opinion, it's the easiest to understand. Because provided you know the anatomy of the brain and the anatomy of the spinal cord, you then know the shape of the pia mater. Because this is just a very thin membrane that you're going to precisely put over the surface of all of that. Now, uh, another important point to say is that if you've ever done anatomy, if you've ever been to an anatomy laboratory and seen a uh, real brain, a brain specimen, often in those brain specimens they leave the pia mater on, they have not taken the pia mater off, so it is a very thin little membrane that will be over the surface of those brain specimens, and you can see the underlying brains. It's a very thin, translucent membrane, and it would make a complete mess trying to take it off, so most uh, anatomists don't bother taking it off when they're creating one of those specimens. Uh, so the pia mater is a very, very thin membrane that's precisely over the surface of the brain and the spinal cord. Right, so that was the easiest one to describe the anatomy of. Now we're going to go to the other extreme. We're going to go to the dura mater. The pia mater lines the central nervous system and it's the easiest to understand. The dura mater is going to line the inside of the bone. It's going to line the inside of the skull, the inside of the cranial cavity. It's also going to line the inside of the vertebral column, the vertebral canal. Um, and it's going to be attached to the bone. And the other contrasting feature of the dura mater compared to the pia mater is it's most complicated to understand. So let me get uh, a fresh colour. We'll go to orange, I think, to do this. So the next picture I'm going to draw then is another picture that we've already seen in this video. And it's going to be the picture where we're looking in at the cranial cavity from above. So we imagine that we chop off the top of the skull and we're looking down at the cranial cavity from above and we can see the anterior, middle and posterior cranial fossae. Uh, and of course, all of that is made up of bone. So that's the reason I'm drawing it because uh, I can point at it and say the dura mater is going to be lining all of this. And so let's just reproduce this picture here once I've got the pen. So need to draw a nice little oval to start off with, like so. And now let's put in the anterior, middle and posterior cranial fossae. So let's start by putting the anterior one in. So here are the clinoid processes. And there we go, that's the anterior cranial fossa complete. Let's put in the cella tertica, which is here. And at the front of the cella tertica, of course, you have the chiasmatic groove. And then 
we'll put in the petrous portions of the temporal bone, which demarcates the end of the middle cranial fossa and the beginning of the posterior cranial fossa, and there is the foramen magnum. So here's the anterior cranial fossa, here is the middle cranial fossa, and here is the uh, posterior cranial fossa. So of course, the bottom of the anterior cranial fossa, the bottom of the middle cranial fossa, and the bottom of the posterior cranial fossa, this is all bone. This is the base of the cranial cavity, the base of the skull. And of course, all the walls of these cranial fossae, they are all made of bone as well. And then, of course, the bit that we've removed from the top, that's part of the skull as well. All of this lining of the cranial cavity, this bony lining of the cranial cavity, it will be covered by the dura mater. So the pia mater lines the central nervous system, the dura mater is going to line the bone. And of course, if we're talking about the spinal cord, it, the dura mater will be lining the inside of the vertebral column, the vertebral canal as it's called. And again, it's going to be adhered up to the bone. So, we now have a lot more, however, to say about the dura mater. You might be thinking at this point, well, well, this is extremely easy. This is going extremely well. Where is the complexity here? This is all very easy to understand. The dura mater, I'm afraid, gets rather more complicated. And here's one of the first uh, hints of the complexity. The dura mater is divided anatomically into two separate layers, uh, whereas the other meninges are not divided into two separate layers. So the, we have two separate layers of the dura mater. Okay, we'll start with the outermost one. The outermost one is sensibly called the periosteal dura mater, or the periosteal layer of the dura mater. Whilst the inner layer of the dura mater, that is called the meningeal layer of the dura mater. Now, why are these sensible names? Well, periosteal, peri means around, osteal means pertaining to bone. So this literally means the layer that is around the bone. So it's the outer layer, so it is indeed the layer that is going to be up against the actual bone. So that's why it's a sensible name. The meningeal layer, well, that's the layer that's more inwards. So that's going to be facing the other meninges, the arachnoid mater and the pia mater, and then the central nervous system inside. So it's sensible to call that the meningeal layer. So uh, let's go a little bit further. Let's now take a little sample and draw a picture here. So I'm going to imagine that I can cut out a little piece of skull here. We can imagine we're taking that little piece there and I want to see the two layers of dura mater uh, attached to that little piece of skull. So I'm going to draw this here. So let's start by drawing the little piece of skull that we've nicked. So here it is in orange, that's the little piece of skull. And just to orient you, this is, whoops, this is the outside and this is the inside. So the dura mater is going to be on the inside facing into the cranial cavity, of course. So let's start by putting the periosteal layer in here. So in, in the aquamarine color, this can be the periosteal layer here. And now let's pick another color. Let's have red, I think, for the meningeal layer. So inwards of the periosteal layer, we've then got the meningeal layer. So again, this is looking extremely simple. We've just decided to split the dura mater into these two separate layers as far as human naming is concerned. Um, we've got the periosteal layer and the meningeal layer. This doesn't seem to have made it any more complicated to visualise, and indeed it hasn't yet, because I haven't told you about the bits that are going to make this complicated. But now I'm afraid we do have to address the things that are going to make this complicated. So the things that make the anatomy of the dura mater complicated are structures called the dural folds, which we'll discuss first. We'll go on to discussing these in just a moment. And then the other things, even more complicated, are the dural venous sinuses. So, before we go on to discuss the arachnoid mater, we're firstly going to discuss both of these complicated features of the dural mater, the dural folds and the dural venous sinuses. So, which one first? We're going to take the dural folds firstly. So, there are two dural folds, well, two major dural folds, and these are the falx cerebri and the tentorium cerebelli. And before I uh, show you these things or discuss even what they are, I'm just going to write down their names. So, there are two dural folds which are where the meningeal layer of the dura mater is going to invaginate inwards to the cranial cavity. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment. One of them is called the falx cerebri and the other is called the tentorium 
cerebelli, often just called the tentorium, and we drop the cerebelli. Okay, so the falx cerebri is going to invaginate into the longitudinal fissure between the two cerebral hemispheres, whilst the tentorium cerebelli is going to invaginate into the space between the cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellum underneath. But firstly, let me just show you in abstract how we build a dural um, fold. So I'm going to imagine this picture again. And imagine now that you are a little man. So here he is. <laughs> I've just created him with the laser pointer. Uh, imagine he's standing here and he's going to grab on to the meningeal um, dura mater here. And he's going to pull it outwards. He's going to pull it away from the periosteal dura mater. And imagine he's also creating more meningeal dura mater at the same time. So imagine that it's stretching and creating more of it. Um, because, of course, you don't want it to snap and break. So we're going to imagine it's very stretchy. It's not in reality, but um, just to get the concept across. Imagine it's very stretchy. So we're going to pull this meningeal dura mater outwards. And what will we end up with? Well, the result is going to be a dural fold. So firstly, let me draw the bone again. So here in orange, that's the bone. Uh, now I need the aquamarine colour back again. So here is the periosteal dura mater, which is still exactly the same. It's still adhered up to the bone nicely. And now let me get the red pen. It's the meningeal dura mater that's now changed. It's going to have been pulled out like this. And of course, we need to put a line down there because um, when you've pulled it out, you've now got two layers of meningeal dura mater that are now adhered up to one another to form this evagination like this. And this is the concept of a dural fold, this concept that you can pull the meningeal layer of the dura mater away from the periosteal layer, and therefore you can get these invaginations of the dura mater, specifically the meningeal dura mater, inwards into the cranial cavity. And in the cranial cavity, there are two major examples of this. The falx cerebri, which is a great big uh, dural fold that separates the two cerebral hemispheres, and the tentorium cerebelli, which is a great big dural fold that separates the cerebral hemispheres from the cerebellar hemispheres below. Right, so the one that we'll discuss firstly is the falx cerebri. So I'm going to draw another very basic picture of the brain, and the next basic picture of the brain that I'm going to draw is we're going to imagine we're standing above the brain, and we're looking down from above so that we can see the two cerebral hemispheres, and we can see the gap in between the two cerebral hemispheres. So we're looking from above, and this is representing the left cerebral hemisphere there, and then on this side... This is representing the right cerebral hemisphere there. Okay, so you can see that there is this gap in between the two cerebral hemispheres, and this is too big to be called a sulcus. We call this a fissure, and this is called the great longitudinal fissure of the brain, or just the longitudinal fissure. So, of course, there is cerebral cortex lining both sides of the longitudinal fissure. So the cerebral cortex continues on down into the longitudinal fissure. If I was a little man and I went walking into the longitudinal fissure, uh, the surfaces of the two cere cerebral hemispheres would be lined with cerebral cortex. Now, of course, they are connected somehow, uh, so the longitudinal fissure does not go on forever. Eventually, if you were going into the longitudinal fissure, you would eventually hit a dead end. You wouldn't be able to go any further down, and that dead end would be the corpus callosum. So I'll sort of put this in. In this position, you have a connection in between the two cerebral hemispheres, and that's called the corpus Callosum. And this consists of loads of axons going between the two cerebral hemispheres. Loads and loads of axons going between the two cerebral hemispheres so that the two cerebral hemispheres can communicate with one another. So this is the longitudinal fissure. There's the corpus callosum. The falx cerebri is a dural fold just like this that comes down from the surface of the skull. So remember, above the brain is going to be the skull. That's going to be lined by the two layers of dura mater, the periosteal dura mater and the meningeal dura mater. And in this midline, you're going to have the meningeal dura mater pulling down to form a dural fold that's going to extend into the longitudinal fissure. And that dural fold that's going to go all the way around the longitudinal fissure, that is going to be called the falx cerebri. 
Okay, it's a dural fold that separates the two cerebral hemispheres. So I'm going to draw you one final picture to get this concept across, not up there. Well, actually, then there is probably space to do it uh, in this uh, position here. I'm going to draw you one final picture, and this picture is going to be what we would see if I chopped through the brain. So I'm, imagine taking a carving knife and taking a sagittal section, cutting right through the corpus callosum, right through the middle, okay, mid-sagittal section, and then I want you to take the right-hand side here and put it over here so that I can see the cut surface. And the reason I'm going to do that is I'm going to show you the cerebral cortex of the right cerebral hemisphere here that lines the longitudinal fissure. I'm going to show you the cut edge of the corpus callosum, and then uh, we will be able to understand where that falx cerebri is going to be positioned. So, let me do this. So, um, let's start anteriorly then. So, here we go. And it will come round like this. And then right round to the back. And we'll just leave that off for a moment. Okay, so we're now going to uh, put on the corpus callosum that's going to have been cut. And the corpus callosum will be in this sort of position, like so, here. So remember, that consists of loads and loads of axons that are running between the two cerebral hemispheres. Um, and that's how the two cerebral hemispheres are going to communicate with one another. We have just cut through that, which is why um, we're seeing the cut surface of it here. So I'll just colour it in there so that it looks a little bit more as though we've just cut through it. All of this tissue here, this is the cerebral cortex that is facing into the longitudinal fissure of the right cerebral hemisphere. So this has not been cut. Our knife went through the longitudinal fissure. It did not damage this cortex. This is all perfectly intact. It's the corpus callosum that's been cut through and the structures beneath, the diencephalic structures. Okay, so before we go any further, let's put what's going to be in here. So what is going to be in here? Here we're going to have the midbrain and the diencephalic structures. So what are the diencephalic structures? The diencephalic structures are the thalami and also the hypothalamus. So let me just go up to another picture that I drew a while ago. Where is it? Here, this picture here. So here's the midbrain and here are the two thalami sitting on top. A structure that I just want to add on here is the hypothalamus, which comes in front of the thalami like this. So the hypothalamus is in this position. However, the hypothalamus is not just one great big solid lump. It is actually hollow. It has a space in the middle like so. And this is continuous with the space in between the two thalami. And that is the third ventricle. Uh, this is full of cerebrospinal fluid and it communicates with the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct which goes through the midbrain and then above uh, empties into the third ventricle here. So in yellow here this represents the hypothalamus and there's only one hypothalamus, we don't talk about hypothalami. Uh, we talk about a left side of the hypothalamus and a right side of the hypothalamus but it is viewed as just being one structure. And together, the hypothalamus and the thalami, they are referred to as the diencephalon. So the midbrain is the mesencephalon, um, the uh, diencephalon, when we re use that term, it means the hypothalamus and the thalami. There are a few other little structures that are considered part of the diencephalon that are apart from the hypothalamus and the thalami. But these structures are easily the major structures that make up the diencephalon. Now, why, have I, why am I going back up to this picture and explaining this? Well, it's because if we take a midline cross-section, look where we're going to end up cutting. We're going to end up cutting right through the third ventricle. Now, the third ventricle is not particularly interesting to look at in a cross-section because it's just a space. So... In my cross-section, what I'm actually going to draw is I'm going to draw the things that you'd see behind the third ventricle. I'm going to draw, for instance, the wall, the right wall of the hypothalamus and the right thalamus. So this is why I've gone back up to this picture, to explain the fact that I'm going to now put in on my picture the right-hand side of the hypothalamus and the right thalamus, which is what you'd see after uh, you've cut through the third ventricle. You'd see the walls behind because CSF is hopefully nice and clear. Okay, so uh, back down we go then. Uh, where is it? Here we go. Okay, so I might just change colour to make the picture look a little bit more interesting. 
I say, which other colours shall we have? We'll have blue. Okay, so in blue then, we are going to put the thalamus in. So the thalamus will be in this sort of position here. And remember, that is the right thalamus. And I've now justified to you, hopefully, why I am showing that. Another thing to say is that underneath the thalamus, of course, is going to be the midbrain. Again, if we chop right down the middle of the midbrain, we will um, not really go through the cerebral peduncle. However, you will see the cerebral peduncle um, behind that gap in between at the two cerebral peduncles. So that's why I'm about to draw on uh, the midbrain here and it's looking nice and long because you are indeed seeing the right cerebral peduncle on that side. Okay, so there's the midbrain and let's now put the hypothalamus on here. So the hypothalamus is in this position. At the front, dangling down from the hypothalamus, you've got the um, optic chiasm. Then you've got dangling down from the hypothalamus. You've got lots of things dangling down from the hypothalamus. You've got the pituitary gland here, the anterior and the posterior pituitary, and then you've got the mammillary bodies here. Uh, so let me just separate the optic chiasm. So that little bit at the front there, that's the optic chiasm. So this is the hypothalamus, and it's connected up backwards to the uh, thalami, and uh, the midbrain there. Okay, so now to try and complete up the picture then. So just join this up here and then put the other brain stem structures on. So we'll put on uh, the pons underneath the midbrain here. And I feel like I need to now keep changing colors, otherwise it'll uh, look a bit strange to keep the same color. So we'll have then the medulla below and then you'd have the brain stem underneath that. And finally, I'll put on the cerebellum behind here that you've chopped through. Okay, right, so here is kind of what it looks like if you chop through. Just to put a final little structure on here to be fancy, uh, let's put on the fornix. So the fornix is very important in memory, and it goes above uh, the gap between the two thalami. So in this sort of position, here is where the fornix would be, a very important structure in the memory forming apparatus. It links the hy hippocampi, rather, I was about to say hypothalami, the hippocampi, it links the hippocampi in the temporal lobes uh, to the hypothalamus, and it's extremely important in forming new memories. In this space here, underneath the corpus callosum, this is where you'll have septum pellucidum, which is separating the two lateral ventricles, the first and second ventricles ventricles as they're called. We'll talk more about the first and second ventricles later on uh, when we want to discuss intracranial hypertension and hydrocephalus. Uh, but for now, that thing above the diencephalon and above the uh, fornix, that is going to be a little septum separating uh, two ventricles, the lateral ventricles, and that's called septum pellucidum, I believe. So that's all of that tissue there. That's just a little septum that is dividing two ventricles that are on either side of the brain in the cerebral hemispheres that are called the lateral ventricles or the first and second ventricles. Okay, right. Uh, so here is our uh, cut sagittal section of the brain. So the purpose that's for drawing this was, of course, so that we can see all of this cerebral cortex that is lining the longitudinal fissure. All of this is part of the right cerebral hemisphere, and it's facing into the longitudinal fissure. And here is the point where it suddenly stops uh, being separate. This is the point where everything becomes joined. The corpus callosum is joining the two cerebral hemispheres, and all of the diencephalon and uh, the brain stem and uh, the cerebellum, that's on both sides, okay? So that doesn't have the longitudinal fissure going throughout it. Uh, so there we've cut actually through a structure that's in the midline. Okay, so the falx cerebri is going to extend, it's going to invaginate down from the surface of the skull into this longitudinal fissure, and it's going to be in all of this position here, and I might just try and actually uh, find a colour to do this in. So what colour would I like to do this in? I might do it in this mustard yellow colour. So in this position, I'm now drawing in in yellow here, all of this is going to be falx cerebri, which is, I will remind you, an invagination of the meningeal layer of the dura mater into the longitudinal fissure. So it dangles down into the longitudinal fissure and it is therefore going to help separate the two uh, cerebral hemispheres from one another. 
Okay, so that is the falx cerebri, one of the dural folds. Let's now discuss the other dural fold. So the other dural fold is the tentorium cerebelli. And this, again, it's the same concept that the meningeal dura mater is going to evaginate outwards. This time, it's going to be evaginating outwards from this sort of region. So if you imagine the skull here, it's going to be evaginating out from this sort of position, and it's going to form a dural fold that separates the... Uh, cerebral hemispheres above from the cerebellar hemispheres below. And in fact, the tentorium cerebelli and the falx cerebri are going to be connected to one another below. So going back up to this picture, here is the falx cerebri going all the way down here, and then it's going to get to the point at the bottom here where you're meeting the cerebellum below now. And here, what's going to happen is it's going to be continuous with the territorium cerebelli. Now, it's difficult to actually show this on a picture because they're in different planes. The falx cerebri is in a sagittal plane, whereas the tentorium cerebelli is in an axial or a transverse plane. So I'll try to put it on this picture, but it's not really probably going to work. So this is kind of the position of half of the tentorium cerebelli, and then it will also be going the other way. Of course, you wouldn't actually be able to see any of this. I'm putting it on here, uh, but you wouldn't be able to see any of this. And I should have put it on in a different colour, so I'm just going to get a different colour so it shows up better. I'll go for evil red, which will show up. So the tentorium cerebelli is in the transverse plane, and it's in that gap between the cerebral hemispheres and uh, the cerebellar hemispheres below. So it's separating the cerebral hemispheres from the cerebellar hemispheres. A better way to show it is probably going back to this picture over here. The reason I wanted to show it on this picture is to emphasise the fact that it is a continuum with the falx cerebri. So the falx cerebri and the tentorium cerebelli, they're connected to one another. And if you don't quite understand the mechanics of how it's all going to work, how, you know, it's all going to be continuous with one another, Think about it very carefully until you can actually visualise how you can uh, imagine evaginating meningeal dura mater to create the falx cerebri and the tentorium cerebelli as one. But let me now ca more carefully show you the position of the tentorium cerebelli. So this is a very good picture for showing the position of the tentorium cerebelli because what we've got here is the posterior cranial fossa and that's where the tentorium cerebelli is going to be because the cerebellum which the tentorium cerebelli is above, is going to be sat in the inferior portion of the posterior cranial fossa. It's sat in here. And the tentorium cerebelli is going to be just above that cerebellum, uh, between the cerebellum and the cerebral hemispheres above. So this is the position of the tentorium cerebelli, now being marked out in red. It is connected to the top of the petrous portions of the temporal bones uh, anteriorly. So it connects up to the top of the petrous portions of the temporal bones. And you have to remember when looking at this picture that the posterior cranial fossa is much deeper than the middle cranial fossa. So they're at different levels. So the posterior cranial fossa is very deep. And the tentorium cerebelli, anteriorly, it's attached to the top of the petrous portions of the temporal bones, and then it extends backwards in the same level, at the same level, in a horizontal plane, and it's attached to the back of the skull here. And that's, of course, where the meningeal uh, dura mater is actually evaginating from to create the tentorium cerebelli. And therefore, if you were a little man, you could now go through this hole, and this hole is left here so that the brain stem can move through there. But if you were a little man, you could go through this hole, and then there would be a great big cavity underneath the inferior portion of the posterior cranial fossa, and that's the cavity where the brain stem and anteriorly sorry, the brainstem anteriorly and the cerebellum posteriorly is located. Above this tentorium cerebelli, this membrane here, if you were standing on top, bouncing on top, uh, that would be where the bottoms of the cerebral hemispheres are sat. Okay, so that is the tentorium cerebelli. And along this line, which again I'll change colour to show, so I'll go back to orange, Along this line here, that's where it's going to be continuous with the falx cerebri above, which is going in the longitudinal fissure, separating the two cerebral hemispheres. So those are the two dural folds. They are these places where the meningeal dura mater has folded inwards, has invaginated inwards uh, to create the falx cerebri and the tentorium cerebelli, which are connected to one another at this place here. 
I think we'll have a break here. Keep trying to visualize this. It's very important that you visualize this and you understand how you could evaginate meningeal duramata to create these structures. So make sure that you do understand how you could create these dural folds. And then once you're happy with the dural folds, then watch the next video where we'll discuss something even more complicated, which is the dural venous sinuses.